the Gospels. Beautiful stories about the life, ministry, and resurrection of Jesus. They have permeated culture and religious thought for nearly 2,000 years. Often from fundamentalists, I hear that these are first-hand accounts of what happened. It's me, I'm that fundamentalist. Of course, they contain many contradictions, some of which can be reconciled and others which cannot. This video will be addressed to the people who think the Gospels were written by eyewitnesses. I've often said in videos that nothing about these books shouts eyewitness testimony, but none of those videos were really about that. So today, that is the question I will be exploring. Are the Gospels eyewitness accounts, and how do we know? A few years back, Milwaukee Atheists made a video saying that the Gospels aren't based on eyewitness testimony. So, do you come to Milwaukee often? I guess if they said that the Gospels were based on eyewitness testimony, they'd be the Milwaukee Christians. But anyway, the video is about as cringe as their intro. Yeah. Anyway, the video represents a lot of your standard objections that skeptics will often raise against the Gospels. So even though it feels a little bit like low-hanging fruit, I think it's important to go over these objections and to have all of these in one video as a resource to you. First, we can look at the internal evidence for these claims. Maybe these are written by eyewitnesses and scholarship has just been wrong this whole time. People aren't perfect, so that's possible. But let's take a look at each gospel separately and together. Then we'll take a look at the patristic evidence and come to a reasonable conclusion on whether or not the Gospels were actually written by people who saw these events transpire. The first thing to notice is that none of them actually claim to be eyewitnesses. There are allusions in a couple of them that hint at how they received their information, but that's beside the point. The Gospel writers did not claim to be eyewitnesses. False. This is false. The author of John repeatedly claims to have been a witness to the events that he recalls. He especially emphasizes that he was a witness at Jesus' crucifixion. He saw it, he witnessed it, he bore record. Interestingly enough, there are small details in the account that confirm this eyewitness testimony. Consider the soldiers dividing up Jesus' garments in John chapter 19. Commenting on this passage, J.B. Lightfoot says, Again, the scene of the crucifixion furnishes St. John with another opportunity showing his intimate knowledge of Roman military customs. A quaternion of soldiers, as we learn from Vigetius and others, was usually employed as a watch on night duty for the purpose of escort. Now, it is noticeable that when the other evangelists speak of the guard which attended at the crucifixion, no number is given. It's simply stated that the soldiers divided the Savior's garments among them. St. John, however, gives the actual number. But observe how incidentally this fact comes out. He makes no mention of the quaternion, he merely says, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart. The information is not paraded in any way. It is involved in the narrative. This subtle little detail is a sign of truth and eyewitness testimony. Let's keep going. They also don't even read like eyewitness testimony. There are simply too many phrases and narrative tools that suggest non-first-hand authorship. Yeah, but what I just discussed with the soldiers dividing Jesus' garments seems to indicate otherwise. But that's just one example, and of course the case is cumulative. Let's take a look at another example of how the Gospels read like eyewitness accounts. John is knowledgeable about the Sea of Galilee. This makes sense if he was indeed a fisherman. In both John 6.1 and 21.1, he specifically says that it has two different names, both the Sea of Galilee and the Sea of Tiberias. The Jewish historian Josephus tells us that Herod Antipas founded a new town near the Sea of Galilee, and he named it Tiberias in honor of the Emperor Tiberius, and he occasionally refers to it by this second and newer name. John also takes note of a specific detail in the story of Jesus walking on the water. In John 6.19, he says that they had rowed about 25 to 30 stadia, which is about three or four miles, in the storm when they saw Jesus coming towards them on the water. Mark 6.47 says that Jesus was on land when they were in the middle of the sea. Because John is familiar with the Sea of Galilee, he notes roughly how far they rowed. No, this isn't full proof that the Gospels are eyewitness testimony, but we certainly can't say that nothing in the accounts looks like eyewitness testimony. Let's take a look at a few more clues inside the documents to see what the authors were like. Matthew 14, 1 through 2 says, At the time Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He's been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. In the same story, Mark mentions Herod's question, 
but he makes no mention of the servants. Someone who says that Matthew is just copying Mark might say that Matthew is just making this part up about why Herod is talking about this matter to his servants. But if we look in a completely off-topic passage, Luke 8.3 gives us the explanation. It says, And Joanna, the wife of Husa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna and many others who provided for them out of their means. Matthew makes no mention that Joanna's husband is working in Antipas' courts, and Luke isn't at all trying to connect this with the story of John the Baptist. Fictional stories and forgeries just really aren't like this. Why would you leave loose ends or raise questions that you don't have to? And how can you control what other people will write in order to make it interlock with what you've written? But we do expect to find these kind of interlockings in authentic, detailed records of the same events told by different people who knew what they were talking about. Another example like this is with Jesus' trial before Pilate. Luke 23, 2-4 says, And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You've said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. What a weird sequence of events. First, the Jews make a serious accusation of sedition. Second, Pilate questions Jesus on this very point. Third, Jesus admits to the charge, basically saying, yep, I'm a king. And finally, Pilate promptly declares him to be innocent. What exactly is going on here? Well, if we look in John 18, 33 through 38, we find our answer. It says, Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. Ah, so Pilate thinks Jesus is some harmless religious nut since he says that he's ruling a spiritual kingdom. That's why he says that he's innocent. But notice how this example goes in both directions. In John's account, Pilate's question to Jesus seems to come out of nowhere. There's no mention about Jesus being accused of making himself to be a king in John. And Luke gives the accusation, but not the full answer. While John gives the full answer, but not the accusation. Again, fictional stories don't interlock in this kind of way. The fact is, is that the Gospels do read like eyewitness accounts. Milwaukee atheists need to go back and read the Gospels again, slowly. And you read. In addition to that, none of the Gospel accounts even tell us who the author is. They are never explicitly identified. Our best manuscripts of these Gospels contain the word kata in the title, meaning according to. This is not something we find in first-hand accounts of anything at the time. According to signifies later authorship. So what if according to wasn't something that was used until Christians came around? How is it even really relevant? Milwaukee Atheist doesn't say. Maybe according to is something that was added when they needed to differentiate one gospel from the other. I don't see a big deal here at all. Oh, what? Let's begin with what was probably the first gospel to be written, the Gospel of Mark. Perhaps it will help to figure out when this book was written. In Mark 13, Jesus mentions the upcoming destruction of the temple. For historians, this is a clear hint to show that Mark was written after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. There are many people that will say this is proof of prophecy, but this is fallacious. It's special pleading. If we can accept prophetic claims from Christianity and Judaism, then we should logically accept them from Muslims, heathens, and Hindus. I'm sure the people claiming this is proof of prophecy wouldn't appreciate that. The other problem is that historians have no way of evaluating prophecy claims, or, for that matter, miraculous claims of any kind. We can solve anything with magic and come up with any answer we want. That's not how history is done. If there are good reasons to think that there are genuine miracles or fulfilled prophecies written in other holy books, then we definitely need to look into that. This isn't some sort of special pleading for Jesus. This is about not begging the question against prophecy or the miraculous in the first place. Saying, we know that this kind of stuff can't happen, therefore it didn't happen, is just blatant circular reasoning. But there's a much bigger problem with this argument. The idea that the evangelists put these words into Jesus' mouth don't really make a whole lot of sense when you look at them in their context. When the abomination of desolation shows up, Mark records Jesus saying, pray that your flight doesn't happen in winter. Writing a decade later, Matthew adds, nor on the Sabbath. And then later still, Luke has Jesus say, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And let those who are inside the city depart. Let not those who are out in the country enter it. The temple wasn't destroyed in winter though. It was destroyed in late August, early September. And if the destruction had already 
already happened, why would Matthew add for his audience a command to pray that the desolation wouldn't take place on a Sabbath? Or why would Luke add a warning for his audience to not enter the city if the city was already destroyed? Who are people talking about when they say the author is Mark? Traditionally, this is John Mark, the Apostle Peter's interpreter. Is it possible that Mark wrote this in his old age? Sure, but the evidence speaks against it. If Mark received his gospel from Peter, why is it that the other gospels have more anecdotes about Peter, including, for example, Jesus telling him, You are Peter the rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. Would Peter himself forget such an incident? I doubt it. This is an argument from silence and a pretty lousy one at that. That's not this again. Yes, this again. Civil War General U.S. Grant makes no mention of the Emancipation Proclamation despite keeping an extensive diary. Grafton's Chronicles mentions the reign of King John but never mentions the Magna Carta in his detailed biography of Constantine. Eusebius glaringly fails to mention the death of Constantine's son Crispa and his wife Fausta. You might get tired of me repeating myself here, but the argument from silence just keeps coming back up. The early fathers tell us that Mark was a gospel based on Peter's preaching. Maybe Peter, having been humbled after denying Jesus three times, decided to leave out his big declaration of Jesus being the Messiah. But he was sure to emphasize Jesus' strong rebuke to him later. But Matthew, being a disciple and having access to the events himself, probably thought that it was important enough to mention. This is a terrible reason for rejecting Mark and authorship. The next gospel to be written was probably the Gospel of Matthew. Traditionally, this is viewed as being written by Matthew Levi, a tax collector and one of Jesus' twelve disciples. Scholars have known for a long time that Matthew was just a rewrite of Mark. The Gospel contains entire paragraphs copying Mark's Greek verbatim. That's no accident. Matthew's Gospel is also written completely in the third person, about what they, Jesus and the disciples, were doing, never about what we, Jesus and the rest of us, were doing. Even when this gospel narrates the events of Matthew being called to become a disciple, it talks about him, not about me. Just take a look at Matthew 9.9. 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. There's not a thing here that would make you suspect the author is talking about himself. This gospel probably came some 10 years after Mark and was certainly not written by an eyewitness. I know it's common to think that if Matthew used Mark that this is some sort of deal breaker, but this isn't something that's really all that difficult to think through. Suppose that Mark wrote before Matthew, but Matthew doesn't want to reinvent the wheel. There are no worries about plagiarism at that time, so there's nothing fishy or unethical about him using a good chunk of Mark's wording. Now let's suppose that Mark already has a gospel written in Greek based on the memories of Peter. Mark's gospel can help with parts of Jesus' ministry before Matthew is personally called as a disciple, and it could also jog Matthew's memory and can conveniently give him some wording to use, though he obviously has the right to use his own words as well. So Matthew sets out to write. In different places, Matthew finds that he remembers or knows something that's a bit different from the story as it's told in Mark. So he feels free to supplement Mark based on his own memories or the memories of those people that he spoke to and wrote things down about. This isn't really all that weird. In fact, we already saw a good example of this kind of thing happening in the story about Herod and his servants. Matthew has his own factual information to add. But what about the fact that Matthew used the third person narrative? Is that a deal breaker? No, in fact, this argument was debunked 1,600 years ago. Writing around the year 400 AD, Augustine encountered this very tired argument from Faustus the Manichaean. He wrote, Faustus thinks himself wonderfully clever in proving that Matthew was not the writer of this gospel, because when speaking of his own election, he writes not, he saw me and said to me, follow me, but he saw him and spoke to him, follow me. This must have been said either in ignorance or with an intent to mislead. Faustus can hardly be so ignorant as to have not read or heard that narrators, when speaking of themselves, often use a construction as if speaking of another. It's more probable that Faustus wished to be bewilder those more ignorant than himself in the hope of getting a hold of not a few unacquainted with these things. Dang, that's a mic drop moment, but Augustine is absolutely right. We see this with the Greek historian Xenophon, or in Caesar's commentaries, or parts of Josephus' Jewish War, Nicholas's History, Dexippus Scythica, and so forth. This third-person argument just shows Milwaukee atheists' ignorance of history. Finally, the calling of Matthew is different, but in subtle little ways, that would go unnoticed if the reader isn't paying attention. 
After his call, Matthew threw a big party for Jesus. Luke records it this way. Then Levi hosted a grand banquet for him at his house. Mark's gospel says, in his house. Matthew's gospel is much more modest, saying, in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came to eat with Jesus and his disciples. Matthew humbly omits all mentions of himself in the grandness of the event. This is a subtle sign of truth, not a clue that Matthew didn't write it. The next gospel, probably written in the mid to late 90s AD, is the Gospel of Luke. Luke is supposedly a companion of Paul. From the very beginning, it should be abundantly clear that the author of this is not Luke. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Luke 1, 1 to 2. If you didn't catch that, the author is telling you that he is writing long after these events and he is recording the information that has been passed down to him. I don't know what kind of argument this is other than to say that Luke wasn't an eyewitness of Jesus' ministry, but that's something we've already known. Luke seems to have spoken with different witnesses of the events. If he traveled with Paul, he definitely would have had access to some of those witnesses when Paul visited Jerusalem. Luke is the only gospel author to mention Joanna, who I mentioned earlier, and she also could have been one of his sources. So Luke wasn't limited to a single source of information. He probably had several. Maybe he had Mark and some other written source that's now lost. But Luke could have also had conversations with people and he could have made detailed notes. Putting together his gospel, he draws on the material selected by Mark, occasionally adopting Mark's phrasing. However, much like Matthew, Luke feels totally justified in supplementing the stories with additional information that he has on hand. Seriously, what is the argument here? Is there an argument here? There has been much debate over the authorship of the Gospel of John, but I think the answer should be clear. This book is also not from an eyewitness. Traditionally, this is viewed as being from the hand of John, son of Zebedee, one of Jesus' disciples. John was seen as the beloved one, or the one who Jesus loved, but this qualifier gives us the information we need to conclude he didn't write this gospel. At the end of the gospel, the author says of the beloved disciple, This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them, and we know that his testimony is true. John 21:24. Note how the author differentiates between his source of information, the disciple who testifies, and himself. We know that his testimony is true. This author is not the disciple. He claims to have gotten some of his information from the disciple. Bruh. Let's read the passage in context for ourselves. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and wrote them down, we know that his testimony is true. It's hard to see how much more explicit verse 24 could be that the disciple whom Jesus loved wrote the gospel. Even if we grant that John 21, 24 is written by someone other than the author, the verse itself says that the disciple Jesus loved wrote what comes before, quote, these things. So this verse is unequivocal about its claim that the gospel was written by the beloved disciple. As far as 21, 24 appearing to express the perspective of a group of people who are placing their approval upon the document, the point of the verse is that this group is expressing approval of a book written by the beloved disciple. This is just a massive overreading from Milwaukee Atheists. Now we're left with the big question. Why were these names attributed to the Gospels and when? Let's begin with some background information. The first thing to note is that until the second century, apostolic authorship wasn't really important. Clement of Rome, for example, knew of Paul's works but didn't bother mentioning Paul as the author. In the 2nd century, any eyewitness would have been dead, and so would everyone they knew. So the church reasoned that they ought to attach names of apostles and companions of apostles to the texts they were using. This can be seen by the rise in texts being written under apostolic names. Until Irenaeus, apostolic authority in the churches was focused on the apostles as a group. It was only in the 2nd century that specific apostles came to be important. The approval of the apostolic literature can be seen by the sheer amount of references and citations to it, not just to the texts that are canonical, but also to the ones that were eventually deemed heretical, including the Gospel of Thomas, the Infancy Gospel of James, the Gospel of Peter, the Acts of Paul, and others. In fact, in the 4th century, apostolic authorship was incredibly important. If an apostle wrote a document, it would automatically be accepted as scripture. 
But the point remains. The authors of the Gospels are not the people whose names are attributed to them. The Gospels were written anonymously and by people who were clearly not eyewitnesses. We just have to deal with that. <sighs> this anonymous Gospel meme just never seems to die. I just want it to stop. First of all, for authors like Clement to make use of the Gospels as authoritative sources means that they expected their audience to recognize their quotations and allusions and accept them as authentic. The fact that he doesn't say, Matthew wrote such and such down, doesn't mean that Matthew didn't write it or that the titles were just simply invented later. This seems to be more evidence for traditional authorship than against it. Second, the fact that the Gospel writers don't name themselves in the documents isn't proof of anything other than Milwaukee atheists' own ignorance of ancient writing. Dozens of the biographical type writings that we have on the 150 years before Jesus and the 150 years after Jesus are formally anonymous. For example, Caesar's commentary on the Civil War was not only written formally anonymous, but is also written in the third person, as we already mentioned, not unlike the style that we see within the Gospel of John or the Gospel of Matthew. Plutarch is considered to be the most important ancient biographer. He wrote 60 biographies, of which only 40 have survived. Plutarch is never mentioned once within the writing. The Gospel author's seeming lack of identification just isn't the problem that skeptics make it out to be. So were the names Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John just plucked out of thin air and added in the late 2nd century? Nah. New Testament scholar Martin Hengel makes the argument that titles like According to Mark were used far earlier than previously suspected. These titles were added sometime before the end of the 1st century, most likely due to the presence of two or more Gospels that needed to be distinguished from each other. Part of Hengel's argument is that the authorship of the four Gospels was unanimously attributed to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John by the middle of the 2nd century. Hengel argues that the only way for this to have happened was for the church to have known for quite some time who wrote the Gospels. If the author's names had not been attached to their writings, multiple names would have been attached as is the case with Hebrews. Hebrews has been attributed to a wide range of authors by the early fathers including Paul, Luke, Barnabas, and Clement of Rome. To put it simply, if nobody knew for six decades who wrote the Gospels, the second century witness wouldn't have been unanimous. Rather, it would have been highly contested and we'd have probably records of that. The only names that we find are the traditional ones. This attribution of authorship doesn't just come from Irenaeus writing from Lyon, France, but Tertullian of Carthage, Clement of Alexandria, a piece of Christian literature known as the Muratorian Fragment, which was discovered in modern-day Milan. This is especially significant when we realize that the gospel spread throughout the Roman Empire as Christianity exploded onto the scene. Yet everywhere we look, the same four names are attached to these same four Gospels. The ancient world was obviously not as well connected as it is today. If somebody just arbitrarily added the name Matthew to the first Gospel, it would be astoundingly rare if somebody in another country did the exact same thing. And yet, in different countries, the name Matthew was always attached to the first Gospel. There's no sugarcoating this. This laundry list of bad objections to the reliability of the Gospels is just bad atheist apologetics. But it's bad arguments like these that Christians hear all the time. So I hope this was a helpful exercise to go through some of these. And thank you so much for watching.